is there a schedule now for the uh, for the test flights on the Lynx One? We have a schedule. We we maintain detailed schedules always internally to the company, but what we always release to the public is what we said for years. Because uh, the t more typical question is when can when can I get a ride on it? When is it available for commercial operations? And the answer is always when it's ready. Uh, the I can say, you know, publicly that we're uh, shooting to put some air under the tires, at least begin the flight test program by the end of this year. But again, I'm as a test pilot, I am a designated pessimist, technically, because that's what you want. You think of the unknown unknowns and what haven't we thought about and what is going to come up that will make us pause and sit back and make sure we're really ready. So, you know, it may well be f uh, first quarter, first half of 2013. But again, we'll begin that process when it's ready very slow and methodical uh, build-up. Flight test is a uh, very disciplined sort of flying. It's not kick the tires, light the fires when you're doing new stuff like this. Uh, we've got a good history with flight tests now in x uh, having done two developmental rocket-powered vehicles. The key difference for us this time is uh, those vehicles on the airframe side started out as airplanes that flew with propellers behind and pusher prop configurations and we put rocket engines on them. Um, so now we have more complexity because we've got a totally from the ground up design vehicle and uh, great concern not just about propulsion systems and that, that end of it, the business end of it, but also flying quality, stability and control, all of those aspects that go into any flight test program. So we're approaching it methodically, diligently, uh, retiring the technical risks as we go and uh, when we're ready to begin flight test, we'll start flight test. Harry Van Holten's going to be very jealous mm -hmm. when you start flying. Yeah, well, Harry, uh, of course, with Space Experience, Curtis Hour, great partners, he has a marvelous back background as a test pilot himself, a Dutch Air Force F-16 pilot. And, uh, you know, I never say never. I think there's a very good shot downstream that Harry will be at the controls of the Lynx. Uh, there are issues beyond technical that are involved with that, with uh, ITAR and so forth, but those issues, if they're workable at all, they're workable between uh, a U.S. company and a Dutch company who has as principals in the company someone like Harry and also uh, the former chief of staff of the Dutch Air Force. Uh, the Dutch are great, great partners with the United States. So, you know, they already had access to so much U.S proprietary ITAR sensitive technology by virtue of their uh, defense work as Dutch F-16 pilots in the Dutch Air Force. So we're very optimistic we can uh, hurdle those uh, non-technical obstacles as well downstream. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, uh, your time at NASA, the uh, sh uh, shuttle missions you were on. I, f I flew three shuttle missions when I was uh, down in Houston, uh, 1993, 96, and uh, in 98. Uh, the first two were as pilots uh, in the right seat of Columbia for the uh, first time we ever flew the shuttle for a two-week long mission on STS-58. Uh, it was also the last time uh, the program ever planned landing at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, so sort of a milestone there. And it was the last time that Columbia ever touched down at Edwards Air Force Base in, Columbia, in California. Uh, that was a focus on life science research. It's called uh, SLS-2, Space Lab Life Sciences II. I uh, followed that up in 96 with a flight to the Mir space station on Atlantis, uh, again in the right seat as an experienced pilot. In fact, everyone on that crew was a veteran, so I had no rookies on that flight. It was an interesting and different dynamic from my first and last flight, which had a lot of rookies on each of them. Uh, very enjoyable. The most unique thing uh, from a personal experience about that flight was working with uh, our former Cold War enemies, working with Russian cosmonauts, uh, some of whom had actually been in the Russian Air Force, and we had been lined up against, you know, opposite the uh, Iron Curtain from one another. So, uh, very fascinating experience from that viewpoint. On the working troop level, I loved working with the Russians, the, the crew dogs. Uh, I have my own opinions about, uh, you know, the how rocky that partnership between the United States and Russia has been through the years, but uh, on a person-to-person on a -person level, it was great. Uh, last flight in 1998, I was commander, so moved over to the left seat of the shuttle, uh, commanded the STS-90 mission, which was uh, again on Columbia. Again, a very focused life science research flight. It was also known as Neurolab because the focus was specifically on neuroscience. Uh, how the brain affects, uh, or how the brain affects, how weightlessness affects uh, the brain and nervous system. Uh, the far and away the most complex uh, research mission, human spaceflight research mission that NASA's ever flown, uh, just by the very nature of the research you're doing. Uh, it was the last of 25 space lab flights. 
Uh, so I like to think that we, as an operational community, reached a point with that 25th flight where we were doing incredibly complex lab work in this incredibly difficult environment out in space. And uh, it really was a, a shining cap, if you say, to that space lab program and very, very productive. The only space shuttle mission out of 135 that had its own book published of peer-reviewed science papers. Uh, very, very uh, productive science research on it, but also very, very, very specialized research, as you would expect. Any scientific paper to get to the point of peer review and in these very esoteric journals of necessity is not the kind of thing that the casual reader just picks up and reads or understands, even in you know, my technical backgrounds in physics and engineering, so I can pick up these life science papers and get through the abstract fine and maybe the first few paragraphs, and after that's kind of okay. We'll skim to the conclusions, you know. So it's sometimes hard for the general public or for uh, even people that are in, in space but not necessarily in that specific field to really appreciate what was accomplished with that, with that mission and missions of its type, purely dedicated research flights, but very, very productive, great to be part of. Um, how long did you sp actually spend in space? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's really a paltry amount of time these days when you talk to ISS astronauts who are up there for months at a time. It was, uh, between my three flights, it was 39 days. Um, and you look at now, the, uh, the ISS space flyers, uh, well, a little bit of background story. The astronauts were on the blue flight suit. Once you've flown a mission uh, on, in the shuttle program, you had a little patch that was awarded to you. It said Mach 25, and it shows a cool shuttle, and it's kind of like, hey, you know, USR-71 guys, Mach 3, uh, really slow, you know, and this is our thing, you know. Uh, but now the International Space Station astronauts have one that's uh, similar design, but it shows ISS on it, and it has the label on it instead of Mach 25 is 100 days. And I think it's just amazing that we are many, many individuals who've been up in space for more than 100 days. The uh, kinds of things, the precursors to expanding human presence out in the solar system are taking place right now and have been the last 10 years or so of space station operations for those long duration stays. It's a, it's a phase of uh, human spaceflight program, the government human spaceflight program, I have not been involved with because I left the program right as they were first putting the first elements of ISS up, but it really operationally is a, is a whole different ball game from what was going on when I was in the space shuttle program.